Looking at the revenue projections of Fortune 500 companies or the GDP growth estimates of the world's industrialized countries, one can't help but notice everything indicating unlimited expansion and wealth opportunities in the future. Upwards and to the right, as they say in management consulting. But when analyzing historical progressions of large companies, countries, or empires, things never work out quite so well. Piero San Giorgio, native to Switzerland and former software executive, where he traveled much of the world working in high technology and developing systems in the developing world, comes at the problems of limits to growth from a unique perspective only a world traveler could have. Author of many books, including the best-selling Survive the Economic Collapse, Piero joins us this evening to discuss the forces behind the perpetual growth drive, what we as individuals can do to survive it, and where we, as a group, can work together to build something better and more sustainable. Well, I'm not a crook. I've burned everything I've got. A military-industrial complex. A new world order. But we are here to destroy the control over the industry of other people. I did not trade arms for hostage. It's been time for Hello and welcome to the myth of the 20th century. Uh, today we are joined by a very special guest, Piero San Giorgio. Uh, he is a survival expert. Uh, he's an author of many books uh, in multiple languages, uh, and he's a world traveler, which we're going to get into. But I'm also joined uh, by my co-hosts, uh, Nick and Hank. Please say hello. Hey, everyone. Hey. And uh, real quick, uh, we got a, a Bitcoin donation from the Bitcoin wallet, starting with the characters BC1Q. Thank you very much. And so today's topic is going to be talking about the myth of perpetual growth uh, in terms of resources, in terms of the financial economy, uh, in terms of our sort of political systems that we've grown up, uh, come accustomed to being stable and as slowly but surely they've become unstable, we start asking these types of questions. Uh, so, Piero, um, because you've been doing this for quite some time, uh, I wanted to introduce you to our audience and maybe give a little bit of a backstory about how you became concerned about the issues of perpetual growth and limits to growth and resource depletion. And what did you do before that? Uh, so, Piero, thank you for coming, and could you give an introduction, please? Sure. Well, also, thank you for inviting me in your great, uh, great channel. Um, I was um, a typical, um, you know, I was born in 1971. I've been uh, born in a family where uh, um, growing and uh, being excellent in your job and, and uh, was, was of paramount importance. My father worked for um, an American company since the, the 1960s, uh, digital equipment out of uh, Boston. And uh, so I've been um, I've been very familiar with American culture since I was a kid, um, traveling to the U.S. And um, my uh, my life has been very much um, focused on you know performing, being a good student, uh, having a good degree, working and getting up the ladder of the corporate world, and um, you know making the American dream. Um, uh, just as uh, as any one of my generation was was trained uh, and 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 was told to, and um, I did. I I went um, to work for an American company, Oracle, software company, in the early nineties. And uh, throughout uh, throughout that decade, in this uh, IT uh, uh, environment, I I developed my marketing skills. I have a degree in marketing to um, get this fairly small at the time company uh, to grow first in Switzerland and uh, and then on to, because I speak many languages, on to uh, emerging markets. And at the time, so that's 93, 94, um, emerging markets were uh, Eastern Europe, Middle East, Africa. 
and uh, at least in, of course, Asia was managed from 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 another other, on, another office. And uh, so I specialize in in starting software operations for uh, for American companies um, in those territories, which were really the, the the very beginning. And I could see the the, the fast growing, the incredible fast growing of these companies of these markets, and not only in software, but all around me when I was traveling. You could see the, the, the implanting of new supermarkets, of, of everything that was common in the U.S. or, or Western Europe started to, 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 to happen in, uh, in Middle East, in, in Eastern Europe, in, in Russia, in Africa, all over, all over the place. And, uh, and of course, this coincided also to, uh, to the, the, the rise of the, of the web, of, of Internet-based web systems. So um, there was also this first wave of web companies that were delivering uh, internet for this country. So I have, for example, uh, as an anecdote, uh, you know, I, I, I spoke once to the Madagascar uh, parliament to explain what, what is internet and how it would revolution, revolutionize the world. And that was 1996. And, um, and on the other side, for example, I, I destroyed my, on, on my own the whole internet in Tanzania once by sending too many emails so just to show that how weak it was at the time, it was really a very simple system. And all this growth, all these um, made me very excited uh, because this was the world we were promised. You know, we were promised that by the year 2000, we would go, we would have uh, bases on the moon and we would have flying cars. And, and, and so Internet was one way to get um, commerce to everyone, gap the divide between the haves and the have nots and, and so on. Uh, however, when I traveled to all of these countries, I could see that the reality of day-to-day -day life for the common people uh, was not exactly the same as in the U.S. Or, or Switzerland, where I live, where I grew up, and that the the reality of the world was uh, was violent, was uh, very poor, uh, very little uh, hygiene and infrastructure. And that, yes, Internet was bringing communications and, and were allowing, I don't know, people uh, in, 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 in Africa to, to see how even better how we were living in Europe and perhaps giving them the idea to move here. And, uh, but, it, but it was just a drop in the water because the reality is that these countries are, are indeed brutal. There's high fertility, high, high, num high number of, of, of children per, per family and so on. The um, Eastern Europe was 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 a bit different, though I must I must say. And in the Middle East, I saw the the growth of the the Dubai, the the uh, you know the, the all the areas around the Gulf. They they had very high growth at the time. But what I, what I also saw is that all this required a lot of energy. Growing these cities, growing Dubai, uh, Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, and of course even the countries in 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 uh, in North Africa and so on. They all these require so much growth and traveling across the world, I could just, you know, start to account, okay, Los Angeles, New York, uh, San Francisco, Atlanta, and then you add the European big cities, London, Paris, and you just count when you're on the plane at night and you land, you see all these flights, all these cars, all these people, and you just start to say, well, wow, this growth, this globalization that is underway, uh, when when this is going to happen in in, in Africa and, and in India and, and in it was already happening in China, I mean, how much energy do we need to get all these billions of people growing and 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 reaching the levels of comfort and life that we have in Western Europe and in America? And uh, at the time, I was selling quite a lot of software to oil industry, to uh, Kuwait Petroleum, to uh, Saudi Aramco, to Total. And um, I got to talk with these guys, and they were all saying, oh, well, yeah, for the moment it's fine, but we're going to have trouble around, you know, 2015, 2020, because there's this thing called peak oil that no one talks about, and, um, and I never heard of this expression. And, and the concept is, 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 is valid for any, any resource, is that if, if a resource is finite, is limited, well, eventually at some point you reach half of the extraction of that resource. And um, and because we're growing exponentially, the the speed to which you reach the the half is much smaller and lower than the speed that you consume the second half. And there were all these engineers and, and geologists were saying, "Well, watch it, because around 2005 to 2015, we're going to have reached 
um, the peak of, of oil, and oil is the most important resource. So at the time, you know, this was um, probably end of the 1990s. I was a bit, um, so I got that, I, I kept that information in, in, in my head, but I kept growing. I went, I joined the internet bubble. I, I joined a few startups and I even had my own company to help American businesses reach uh, into, into Europe. And it was quite successful. And even when the, the internet bubble, you know, bursted in 2001, it was, Okay, it was it was you know a, a bump in the road, but everyone was saying, "Well, don't worry, we'll just have new innovation. Uh, we're going to bring i uh, you know smartphones. Uh, we're going to bring even more services, uh, business business to business kind of application, and and this is going to help globalization be even more efficient and bring information to even more people so that they can do better commerce and." And, and exchange goods and ideas and information across the world, which require even more oil to make the tank, to make the big uh, cargo ships, um, the freighters and the cars and the, and the trucks uh, and the trains function and deliver all these goods that get traded at, the, at speeds that we had never seen before. So all of this was, was great and things kept growing. And to give you some perspective, I started to figure out that when you know when I was born, the world was probably four billion people, and um, we're now seven, almost eight. So we almost doubled in forty-five years. And um, and I checked the past, and we were three billion people in nineteen uh, in nineteen forty, and we were two billion people in nineteen ten, and we were one billion people in eighteen fifteen. So this growth is, 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 in, is exponential, and this is, of course, because of industrialization, because of Western modern medicine, uh, and, um, and this kind of growth is, uh, has brought amazing uh, comfort and, and quality of life to so many people across the world, starting especially with Western Europe and America. But now everyone in the world wants to have this level of life. So I started to ask myself the question around 2000, 2003, 2005, do we have the resources to get so many billions of people and keeping growing and having the, the type of life that um, Americans and Europeans uh, are having? And I started to check the data. I started to check, you know, production of steel, production of, uh, of the different ores, bauxite for aluminum. And, uh, and I started to, f to find through my customers and through my own research that this is not going to last forever because the environment is finite. So, of course, my friends told me, yeah, but don't worry. Innovation makes things more efficient. You know, we have a better efficiency in, in, in engines. We consume um, to manufacture the same stuff. Now we, we use less materials than, uh, than uh, 20 or 50 years ago. But then we produce, but I, I remarked that, sure, we produce less per unit, but we produce way more units. We produce way more cars. So, yes, the engine is more efficient, but we produce more cars, more heavy cars, and we drive more miles. So, in total, we're actually consuming way more resources for shipping, flights, day-to-day uh, uh, -day consumption. The, the size of our houses has, has grown and so on than before. And to add to this the fact that I was very much involved into into selling my company to, to some American company in, uh, in 2003, 2004, um, I had to study a bit how the finance market worked because I could, not, I could not understand how these guys were financing, were setting up the way they were buying my company. It was a bit opaque, let's say. And so I started to dig a little bit in New York on, on how the stock market was working. I, I played the stock market like everyone in the 90s, but... But suddenly I figure out that all of this thing is based on huge debt and the, the money is actually created out of thin air. So I know my history. I know what happens when, when, uh, when the monetary base is, is, is debased and it's, um, it grows again exponentially and the debt grows. It's eventually these things collapses. So I started to add you know, energy problems, financial problems. And then, of course, there was the, it was the road to war in 2003. Uh, after September 11, and there was all these lies about weapons of mass destruction, about uh, you know Colin Powell lying in front of the United Nations, and 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 this was so obvious 
that, um, uh, and we started to have doubts about September 11, what really happened. And, and I said, and I started to be perhaps less naive than I used to be. What I realized that governments lie to us all the time. And, um, and so this started to, to bring, and I should add, I had the consciousness of the environment, not, not, not like today where people seem to be um, eager to have more taxes, but it was the idea that I had seen across the world all these very beautiful uh, environments of, of, of Africa and, 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 and the destruction that we, are, we as humans and, and the modern economical system is bringing uh, as we grow more, as we destroy natural habitats to build roads and, and, and housings. And I've seen, of course, in Eastern Europe, the disaster that the Soviet socialist system has brought on, on the environment over there. And uh, including nuclear nuclear pollution, uh, and um, I had a Russian girlfriend from Murmansk, and uh, she was telling me that they were they just abandoned some nuclear submarines on the pier to just rot, and um, and they were all scared that they would get contaminated eventually. So so there was this carelessness and this um, uh, this environment destruction pollution, which also created. In, in my view, some uh, ecological niche that col- would collapse over time in different parts of the world. And of course, all of these niches are linked. And we, and we as, as humans uh, need these ecological niches to function so that we can grow food and, and have healthy food. Now, add to that the industrialized um, agriculture that destroys the, the soil and that kills the, the the nutrients in the soil that enable great food and and and, and quality food to be grown, um, which also requires a lot of energy to to be produced and, and fertilizers, which themselves are produced through the usage of a lot of energy. We are. I ended up to the conclusion around 2005 that we are running towards a perfect storm, a perfect storm of ecological disasters. Of um, and, I, and I'm not even touching global warming. I, I'm absolutely not convinced that this is a true, um, true phenomenon, nor that it is man-made. But still, ecological disasters, uh, financial disasters, um, uh, human disasters, social unrest, wars for resources, and um, and this all seem to me to start around 2020, 2022, roughly. And, and from and from there on, the world will start to be much more uh, unstable and um, much more difficult to manage. And I and I, and I must admit, I didn't even see the, all the craziness about the social justice warriors that we find in every company now, the the converged companies, the all these debates about um, these crazy f- social uh, discussion about what is being a man, being a woman. LGBTQ, pedophile, whatever. All this I didn't even foresee because I was in a world where you had to work for a living and not just uh, talk and, and being uh, like in a university. So, so this was the path that led me to write my first book. And, um, and when it came out, it was a huge success in, in, in France. I wrote it in French. And then it, was, it started to be translated in, in, in English in, in many other languages. And I think it's about 12 now. And, um, and then, of course, I wrote more books to to give solutions to to what's happening because uh, showing the problem is one thing, but of course what's interesting to me is to tell, first of all, to myself, (laughs) but also to to others, what what are we going to do about all this? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things is you look into uh, the sort of the genre of like, you know, just the limits of exponential growth you really see people fundamentally they don't actually argue uh, against it from a empiricist perspective. They uh, against the idea that like this is fundamentally unsustainable. Like the libertarian crowd is uh, very um, kind of almost disingenuous in their reasoning because they talk a lot about how, uh, well, economic growth has lifted uh, billions of people out of poverty, um, and it's our best shot um, for all of these people in the developing, uh, the developing world, uh, developing in giant uh, air quotes, of course, to uh, sort of achieve the lifestyle 
And the question of, you know, but is that actually possible? There's this gigantic hand wavy motion where they say, well, every time in the past where we've anticipated that something was going to run out, uh, they've ultimately become uh, proven incorrect. Like the famous uh, Paul uh, Ehrlich, or however you pronounce that, um, yes. uh, predictions of you know mass famines um, by uh, the year 2000 and like the, the earth having a sustainable population of like under a billion people, which, you know, in fairness was completely false. But then they, they then like extrapolate that to, well, we were wrong at X, Y, and Z times, therefore in perpetuity, like we can produce four percent more stuff forever until the end of time. Oh, and by the way, like not only will we produce four percent more stuff, but somehow we're going to produce four percent more stuff. But the stock market is going to rise at eight percent per year, yes. which is just not even a not even an empirical claim, but like a a like arithmetic falsity that you can have like things growing at a certain underlying rate but then have the value of ownership of those things be growing at a higher rate and i've never encountered somebody who can adequately explain to me other than if you go full transhumanist and say well at a certain point the curve just goes vertical and we're then just like brains and vats and like effectively we're no longer resource constrained at all. That's the only argument that I've seen for uh, sort of escaping some sort of Malthusian steady state. And, you know, having worked in that field of uh, you know, artificial intelligence for a while, I, I don't exactly take those predictions seriously. So I'm firmly on the side of, there the important thing is not the existence of a limit there has to be a limit and it's an interesting empirical problem to say well where exactly is that limit and can you arrange to be there in a steady state instead of a hard landing uh rather than just kind of disputing disingenuously the preposition of the entire question if i can offer some observations and actually i have a question uh, related to what you just said, Hank, about hard versus soft landing. Uh, my observation is that even though we have quantitatively more things to buy, things are cheaper, qualitatively, things have gotten worse. Uh, the simple example I can give is an automobile. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I think the, the styling of most cars today is is awful, and I would prefer something from the 19. 60s or even 50s uh in terms of just the the appeal of of the products that we get today there's this term uh, called uh, brand necrophilia which i've uh, become aware of recently where if you take like a power tool for example and you you just buy a new one from home depot or wherever you can buy power tools and then you you go into your uh, your grandfather's uh, workshop and you pull out the same power tool which you know Obviously, it has to be one that is is not recently invented. So you, let's take a, a skill saw, something that a circular saw that that cuts wood, you know, with uh, electric power. If you take something like from the 1970s, even uh, you'll notice that it's a little bit simpler, but the the wiring is is much more. Um, W better insulated uh the the motor is is just built stronger there's there's more materials in in each of these items that you can find you can take a look at housing i mean cars i was just mentioning i mean the, the amount of steel in the older cars is much higher uh if you look at the the sheet metal in factories today they're almost as thin as pieces of paper uh, because we've had to economize, we've had to become more efficient because there's more people consuming each item. Uh, and so, what, you know, you can take a look at this in housing as well. Uh, the walls are made of cheaper materials. They're built out of smaller pieces of wood. Uh, and arguably, it's, it's better. But if you go back really far in time, there's, uh, there's pictures of 
some of the the architecture and buildings they built in in Germany uh, 800 years ago, where the walls are are literally like solid timber. Like they would just take tree trunks and just put them vertically next to each other, and then you compare them to the ones they're building today, and they're they're hollow and they're they're filled with. Uh, uh, artificial like insulation made from petroleum probably um and just the quality has gone down and some of the beauty of of these old cities is because they they come from materials and craftsmanship that just doesn't happen anymore i mean the architecture of skyscrapers even uh is inferior in my opinion to the stuff that used to be made not even that long ago maybe even 50 or uh 70 years ago where you had art deco stonework uh exteriors the in new york the famous examples that i like to give are the empire state building and the chrysler building uh and these to me are are some of the most beautiful works of, of art in the city in terms of architecture and today you'll you'll find things made out of steel and glass uh that are you know arguably able to go higher and and in some ways better but they all look the same they're boring and they're kind of sterile looking there's no soul to them so the quality has gone down and you know if you tr- try to like uh, understand like okay how does the stock market interpret that well it it doesn't really it's basically just it's total profits and so total profits is basically units num- units sold and then profits per unit multiplied together so if you you maybe have you know arguably a stable amount of profit even though the consumer is getting a less qual- uh, qualitative good uh, if you have enough quantity that's going up, and I think we've seen that with the rising populations and globalization, uh, you can still have a rising financial market, which unfortunately is being benefiting just the, the people at the top, not necessarily the people at the bottom. Uh, but you can still have this wonderful stock market that the politicians like to tell us about as an indicator of, of health of the economy, at least. But if you just look at simple day-to-day examples, we don't see it. So my question about hard versus soft landing, uh, Piero, was are we already seeing kind of a soft landing in the sort of examples I'm giving where things are just getting worse slowly? And then if that's true, will we see a hard landing where things all of a sudden just go Venezuela where you can't even find food in the, in the supermarkets? And if that's true, like where have you seen that before? Soviet Union yep. comes to mind, but in the Western world, is that more you know likely or is there something else that's going to happen? Sure. So actually, the way you look at long-term um, uh, evolution of societies in terms of uh, development, comfort, uh, health, and so on, really depends of the scale of that out of of the, the scale you you choose. For example, let me give you two or three examples. If you are in the, um, you know, if you're in Europe in 1347, and um, and and people and, and you look at the way things are going. Well, you basically see uh, four or five centuries of unstopped growth, improvement of technology, and um, improvement of commerce and wealth across the, the across the whole continent. And you, you, if someone says, "Hey, things may not be so great," it, you know, you will say, "No, you're." It makes no sense because look, for the last five hundred years, um, thanks to and you can say whatever. Uh, social structure of the time, whether it's the church or the or the first, um, you know, the move to the cities of a lot of people, and this is great, and and it has never been that great, except that one year after there's a ship landing in Marseille, full of uh, rats with fleas on them that bring the black plague, and half the people die. If you're, um, I can go even further back, you know, the, the people who lived in the third or even fourth century in Rome. Hey, they lived a great life in a city of a million and a half people with sewers. I mean, you just you just lack the electricity, but to be to be just a modern city, and they had sewers, they had uh, fresh water, they had uh, food from all the known world coming to them every day. Hey, but one century later, the the the, the empire collapsed and the city is sacked by by the gods, and um, and so it depends on what is the scale that you look you look for, uh, and, and and you set yourself so. In today's world, uh, and, and you mentioned Malthus, and for sure, people who people people who who are are criticizing criticizing Malthusian approach of, of analysis are, are correct. They say, well, he didn't foresee the industrial revolution in and in the first and the second, 
he didn't foresee the, 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 the green revolution of, of, of productivity. Of course, and, and it is true that we, we, we can maybe hope, I don't know if it's the right word, but we cannot foresee the technological um, solution of the future that could solve a lot of the problems we have today. That is absolutely correct. So in that sense, I'm not a prophet. I'm just I'm just someone who, who points a lot of the problems that are now. But I, this is not new. However, what I think I point I pointed in the last ten years is that the, these these problems are converging, and I, and and I'll, and I'll answer your question here. These points are converging to uh, a window of time that is pretty narrow in 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 time and space. Let's say it is uh, in the next. Um, uh, let's say five years, that I think we start to have the highest chances of, of what I call a collapse. Now, are we, now in, in my travels, uh, I've seen, of course, you can study history. You can study the collapse of, of the Roman Empire. You can study the collapse of the Maya, of the uh, Eastern Island. Uh, Jared Diamond, the, I probably is the only good book about Jared Diamond, is, is this one about um, uh, the collapse of these civilizations. I, I, don't, I don't think in the other ones he has serious uh, data, but anyway. And um, you, can, you, can see the, you can see the collapse of, if, very near to us, you can see the, the collapse of Germany in 1919, who is the hyperinflation of the, of the mark, uh, of the currency. You can, you can watch the, the collapse of Yugoslavia, uh, hey, everything was go- doing great in, in Yugoslavia until 1992, 93, and then they went into hyperinflation, and then the country split into different countries, and they went to war. And um, you have the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. You have you have many s- cycles of of growth, collapse in 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 history. Only now we are one global society. We are we're one globalized uh, economy. And what, something that impacts Japan will impact the United States, and, and, and likewise, and so on. I lived, I lived one collapse in my life. It was the collapse of the Zimbabwean dollar in the late 1990s. And the, the, the solution of the government was to fix the prices of food, which meant that food was not available and people were starting to riot in the streets. And Africans are not well organized, but when they riot, they riot. They destroy everything on their path. At least that was the case in, in Zimbabwe. And I've seen something similar in Togo uh, one year, one year, one year before. And, uh, and and of course, I was I was fortunate not to live in in not to be in uh, in Rwanda when the, the genocide happened, because um, a million people killed with machetes is uh, with with big knives is is probably not a pretty sight. So so these things happen. Societies do collapse. This is people who say, "Oh, things will always get better." Once again, depends what is the scale you look. If you're in 1950 and you say things will always get better, you're probably correct. But you're if you're again if you're in 1347, well, you are missing some of the data because you cannot see, and it's not your fault. It's you cannot blame people who believe in the future being always uh, rosy and nice, and and they they just lack some of the data. However. My job is to say to people: first of all, um, think by yourselves. You know, don't don't just believe uh, people who be, who are who are doomsayers like or, or like me, for example. But don't also not don't believe those who say, well, just you know, just things are going to be better always forever. Think by yourself. Look at the data. Look at the the production numbers. Look at the energy consumption. Now, as for the how we land, if we land. There's different different thoughts that come into this. First of all, is has anyone any interest, any anything to gain from 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 any landing whatsoever? And when you look at the when you look at how the the, the economical system is, is is set up, what you actually figure out is that there's there has not been much real growth since the 1980s, and in fact everything has been funded by debt, and that debt has been growing and growing. And today is several fold bigger than the GDP of most countries. For every country, the, the national debt is much bigger than the GDP. So the reality is like is that the politician and the people who are managing the, 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 the who are, you know managing the details of all of this, they have they don't have many choices. They can 
mm, declare bankruptcy and say, well, okay, we start over, we clean, uh, we clean house and we start, we start it over. But this has severe political and social uh, consequences. Or they can say, well, you know, we, 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 keep, uh, we keep getting in debt and the problem will be solved by the future generations. Uh, our children, our grandchildren will have to pay this debt or at least they will have to manage this problem. Or uh, they, they say, well, not to worry because we will grow for, with whatever magical solution that they have no idea uh, because no one can read the, f the future uh, in terms of innovation. We, we, we don't know what is going to happen. Maybe, maybe five years from now we have functioning um, fusion to generate electricity, but I've been hearing this since I'm a kid and I don't see fusion working. And since, I, since my book came out in, in, in 10 years ago, my first book, I hear people who talk to me, oh, don't worry, fusion is just, it's just around the corner. Well, it's 10 years, I don't see anything. And, and then I have some, there's always some wild beliefs such as, oh, oil is not, um, is not a biotic product, or oil is abiotic, which comes from the earth, which is pure nonsense, and we can easily prove it's not the case. But some people cling to these kind of beliefs because they don't want to see the reality that there are some of the problems that in life, such as old age, well, they don't have a solution. <laughs> you eventually die, for example. So I don't see that there is any willingness from the people who govern the different countries of the world and, and the international organizations to actually see any of these problems. I'll give you another example. I've interviewed, actually met, um, what's the name? Uh, the name eludes me suddenly. Uh, um, Nobel, Nobel Prize of Economics. Uh, Krugman. Krugman. Krugman, yes. I met him in Geneva once. And he was telling us in 2012 how things would be great and everything was growing. Well, he's been right for the last seven years. But I asked him the question and saying, yeah, but are you taking into account um, the energy required to do all of these innovations and new infrastructure that's, that are going to be built and so on? And he said, well, we take... When we do our forecast for the future, as economic, as econom, as financial economic people, we take we take as a granted that energy will always be available in sufficient numbers. Aha! That's an interesting uh, that's an interesting um, uh, element of, of that is missing. So what you see is you have people who think in silos. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, an expression in, in, in English as well, but people who, you know, financial economists, they think of the, the economy. They don't think about energy. They don't think about the environment. They don't think about food production. They don't think about social unrest. For them, this is, a, of course, these things are going to be okay, but how we grow the economy. And, um, and so everyone thinks a little bit is known on his own field of study, and they, they don't cross this information and, and cross check. So, because when I talk with uh, you know with oil companies, the managers they say, "Oh no, don't worry, we'll keep producing a lot." So um, that's why we need to keep investing into uh, new oil fields and uh, new technologies to go and grab uh, even more oil. And the and the geologist people they tell me, "Well, you know, the in Saudi they don't have as much oil as they claim to have." And um, and so I go back to the to the to the um, to the managers and they say, well, the engineers say that there's no more oil. And they say, yeah, but, you know, we'll always find more oil. Well, that's not what data shows. We find less and less new fields of oil. And then they say, oh, but new technology will enable us to, to get more oil per field. Yeah, but this is an admission that you don't find more fields anymore, that mm -hmm. you are you are kind of scraping the, the, the barrel or, of, of whatever is left. So there is this lack of... Um, Figuring out the reality, and this maybe is the job of people like me who are not specialists, who are, you know, I have, I think, I hope good instincts, but, I, and I go and dig the data in, in a horizontal way, in transversal way, not, not in a silo. And then, of course, the, the question is that everyone has vested interests in things continuing the way they are. So you don't actually, there's even a psychological um, shutter that, People in charge don't want to see the consequences of what I'm what I'm telling in my books, and even the people who, for example, there's a lot of green environmentalists who understand this this collapse, 
And actually, some of them are starting to say, yes, there will be a collapse. And yet, they cannot come to the reality that collapse means violence between people. No, for them, it's going to be, oh, it's going to collapse. Therefore, we will all live with, with, in a different world, we'll consume less, and we'll have hugs and kisses for everyone. No, 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 no. This is not what I've seen in the world. Uh, maybe if, you're, if Sweden collapses and you only have Swedish people or Japanese people, maybe you have hugs and kisses and you find a different lifestyle, but not in a multicultural world and not with a lot of societies which are tribal. Um, most of the world works in a tribal way. And if your tribe is suffering, it's fair game to go to the next tribe and, and plunder it and steal and kill and, and take the resources. This is, this is the way a lot of the people in the world think. And uh, so the environmentalists, they don't, they don't want to see that. They, they shut their, their, their eyes and they say, no, 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 no. This is not going to happen. Um, we're going to collapse, yes, but it's going to be the opportunity to change life and, and, and live uh, uh, peace and, in peace and love and, and, and drugs. No, it's not going to happen this way, I think. And, and who knows? Maybe I'm, I'm the paranoid guy who's, who's wrong. And maybe, you know, the, what I've seen in Africa and, and in the Middle East, in Iraq, in, 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 <laughs> in I think to Syria, and maybe this is just a, an epiphenomenon, but I don't think so. I think I, this is the reality of the world. I, I think your observations make a lot of sense. And also, you mentioned the politicians and the business managers in particular not wanting to admit that there might be limits to growth. And I think that is explained simply by the fact that our system rewards people who can promise more and better, uh, as opposed to maybe the scientist who is inculcated in a sort of culture and a philosophy, arguably at least relatively more than the manager and the politician to look at the truth and try to prove it with science and the scientific method of repeatable results based on, you know, theory and then proving it. Um, but I, I, I think that tells me that essentially the system will continue to attempt to perpetuate the current growth model until it's too late, as opposed to trying to gradually adjust things in a more logical, planned out way. Uh, it will basically collapse and then people will obviously not be able to claim that things are going to get better and then something will resolve itself. And the theory that it will be violent is probably accurate as well. How violent and how that will play out is sort of unknown because, as you've mentioned, our civilization is a global one. And I don't really think we've ever really seen, to the extent we do today, this ever before. Uh, and that really makes it confusing to me because the issues of multiculturalism are compounded by that fact that we all sort of watch... Hollywood productions and we have this vague notion that we're part of one group but the first thing that people who have been in prison say is that when they're thrown into prison uh, your uniform is your skin color and things get really brutal when resources are limited and you're dealing with people who are sort of desperate and not very nice either and I don't know how the Western world is going to handle this because we've kind of taken on the, the strategy well we is kind of a uh, probably an inaccurate term, the government and the elite have taken on the strategy of melting all the different cultures together into this one global one, but it's just a surface level integration. I think deeper down there's a lot of divisions, and I think when you strip away the surface level comforts, you do see the, the deeper divisions, as we've seen in America so many times whenever we have... Uh, a controversy uh, there are big riots uh, we had natural disasters where the government completely failed and people were basically acting uh, acting like savages and reverting to cannibalism and theft and it's it's quite scary and and yes I agree the Japanese will probably do as they did after the tsunami but unfortunately the rest of the world or the Western world is, uh, at least is not quite as capable of that so I, I, I think you're you're completely on target and you're observations and 
I'm, I'm a little bit more convinced that the landing will be hard because, as you say, you know, the government just keep borrowing more and more money and there's not enough money to pay for it annually. And so therefore, our, gr- our debt to GDP rate keeps rising in the United States, at least. Uh, and I think that's been true in most of Europe. I don't know about you know, Germany, you know, Germany is probably one of the exceptions, but the, uh, the majority the of the West, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's the same. It's the yeah. same all over. Yeah. So and I think, I mean, that that's one of the, I think that's spot on when you, when you talked about the, uh, the system kind of having growth as a predicate, you don't really have to look that far uh, to see this in action. You can look at the domestic United States at your average pension fund where they are depending on uh, four, five, six, seven, eight percent returns ad infinitum just to keep their head above water. And every year that they don't achieve that is another couple of years, if you look at a sufficiently long horizon, uh, that they uh, fall uh, fall behind in the future. And they don't simply, you know, scale down of the system usually instead what they do is they increase predation on the other productive parts of the economy in order to acquire those resources that were supposed to materialize through the magic of the invisible hand but instead it's coming directly out of your property tax bill which is increasing relentlessly directly proportionate to the shortfalls in your chicago public employees pension fund so it's extremely easy in those circumstances to enter a death spiral where, I mean, for a while, you can kind of take the legible parts of the economy where you actually are able to look at things like market returns and how many dollars were deposited into my bank account and to make up that deficit by liquidating the non-legible parts of your economy, like, you know, taxing uh, taxing economic activity that is, you know, somewhat elastic. You can try to like pull a fast one and basically grab everything that's not nailed down and liquidate it, um, for fire sale prices. And that works for a little bit until people sort of wise up and then you still have the same underlying structural problem and you've exacerbated it because now you've liquidated not only a whole bunch of physical capital, but a whole bunch of social capital. I mean, it's just absurd that you would uh, advise somebody to move into someplace that'll be a failed state, literally a failed state um, within the decade, I'm guessing, um, or in the case of California, whenever the next uh, big earthquake hits. Yeah. I have a, I, excuse me. Yeah, I was going to ask you about what do you think the elites are going to do to try to manage this potential collapse? I mean, you're from Switzerland and the elite in the, you know, in the world, arguably uh, meet in Davos every year at the World Economic Forum to talk about the big issues facing ostensibly the world, but uh, in many ways, it's the the issues facing them. You know, how do they how do they sort of manage the population of the world in such a way that you know it doesn't become a problem to their power structure? This is how I interpret it. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of Agenda Twenty One or if you think it's just a stupid conspiracy theory, but I do think there is something to the fact that the elites all coordinate together, and there has been a trend towards urbanizing the world and moving people out of rural areas or uh, yeah out of uh, rural areas to urban areas so away from farmlands to cities and trying to concentrate the populations in my view in a way that can be more easily controlled uh but i don't know if um as we've talked about the limits to energy for example i don't know if this is actually going to work uh but i I would like to know piero if you've met a lot of you know top business people i'm sure uh, and i don't know if you've ever been to davos but um you must know a little bit more than we do given that you're in switzerland about what you think this type of people and this group are are planning for us uh what is their agenda and do you think it's going to work do you think it's um going to fail well i actually it's funny because i've been to davos once i mean uh, to the to the world economic forum and uh i know pretty well the uh, Klaus Schwab, the guy who who started this, and uh, 
I don't. I, first of all, let me dispel for for the, the idea that this is like a big conspiracy, and they meet behind closed doors, and they have this agenda, and uh, and they. It's um. It's much. It's 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 worse and and simpler than that. It's just people of at this level, they have very common thought patterns because they have very common education paths. They have very common interests in. Uh, the same things in, in you know, no one goes there and says, oh, it's going to collapse. No, they, they go and say, oh, the environment is dangerous. Therefore, there is opportunity for, um, you know, green economy. And they, they, they have a lot of these nice feelings, but they're all interested in profit and they're all interested. And globalization is, a, is an incredible vector for growth and therefore more 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 profit for and more opportunities for for that and and they're all very happy you know these guys it's very interesting they are very happy when they have this uh, new company coming in from um, developed world because for example actually it's a, it was a customer of mine in the 90s but for example ashanti gold um, the la- one of the largest gold producers in the world is out of ghana so suddenly they have this um, Really well managed, interesting company from an African country, actually one of the best performing African countries, Ghana. And um, actually, you never hear about immigrants from Ghana, right? Because the con- the country is doing well, and so they 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 show this. Oh, great! You are you are from from this country, and this country is a is a um, is a case study for development, and it's doing great. And they manage they actually decrease the the, the birth rate, so so everything is fine, but it's one example, and of course, it's not this. It's not the same in Nigeria, and so on, and so on. Okay, and just as a, as a parenthesis, but but so they all they all have this these common thought patterns where they, of course, they they are all self congratulate congratulating about the growth, and no one is going to say that this is unsustainable. And even if you would say, well, uh, how about oil, well, or or energy or resources. Well, they will say, well, let's fund um, a venture firm that invests into uh, new technology companies that f- in, in the energy field, for example. That's how they think. They don't think in, oh, oh, oh damn, this is, this is going to be bad. They're thinking into new, uh, new investments, new th- because this is, the, this is the way they, they think, and I understand very well this thinking. Uh, however, I think there are... And, and by the way, maybe they are correct. And in the end, they, they will be right. And in the end, because it's smart people, maybe they, they know what's better. But I doubt that. I my my the data I, I've I've researched and the, the the instincts that I have, and you know, take this for what it's worth. Um, because I've seen many countries, and perhaps because my personality is that I don't stay in the five star hotels when I traveled in Africa. I went in the streets. I went. I, sometimes it was dangerous. Sometimes I shouldn't. I took too much too much risks. In fact, I was lucky. But uh, I went to see the real stuff. So so when when the billionaire from Wall Street, when 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 the the heads of Google and and, and Facebook or whatever, or even uh, when when they meet African leaders, of course it's well behaved people and and everything is very nice. And of course they say, well, hey, if uh, if if all Africa can become like uh, like France or or Italy or or the UK, it's great, and we'll have more opportunities. But no, in fact, they are turning France and 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 Italy and 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 the UK and America like Mexico and 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 Ghana, and uh, they're 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 reversing the problem because they don't see the real people. They don't see the the they 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 talk about poor people, but they never met one. They talk about um, developing countries, but they never met the people in the slums and, and the way they, they don't know them. They don't know the, the way they think. So, in fact, they are very ingen- in, ingenuous, in, in, uh, disingenuous in, in, in the way they look at the, uh, at the world. But because they are very rich, because no one ever tells them no, they go on. And, and, and so it's more than... Um, and of course, there is culture. I mean, I'm not denying that some of these people, they have a deep culture of domination and some of them might even have some religious beliefs about crazy ideas of domination and 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 they have this uh, you know this direction that they want to take the world into but i think the majority are just into this um 
uh, the, the way of the, the world is thinking at this right uh, time. I think there's a German word which is Schadenfreude. The, the, this is the, this is, no, the Weltanschauung, sorry. The Weltanschauung is the German expression to say this is the way the world thinks now. And so it's very difficult to think differently. And people, humans, the same humans as you and I, uh, in different cultures would think in a very different way, and as, as indeed I think the Chinese are thinking in a different way. They are planning much more long term. And when you look at the preparations of China and even Russia for, uh, I've, I've been following the military development of, for example, Russia for civil protection of, of the citizens in, in, since the 2010s, they are building tens of thousands of nuclear shelters for the population. So they are be, so either they have a great deal with cement companies, or um, or they are planning for something since 2010. Yeah, in their classrooms, they they have standard Kalashnikov training, where I mean, young women and men will basically be taking apart the rifles and putting them back together, so they understand how the components work and if they have to clean them right. and repair them. Um, yeah, we got we got uh, JROTC schools in the U.S. too. I'm sure that's not every Russian classroom. <laughs> yeah, um, I think you're right, Piero, uh, about about the sort of elite. I think a lot of them are just kind of incentivized and a little bit delusional by their own success. Uh, there was uh, an anecdote I heard. I can't remember exactly where it was. It was one of these financial news channels i think where I, someone was being interviewed and he was talking about how you know in the 1980s when the united states was moving a lot of the the petrodollars that they were getting from uh saudi arabia and other oil exporters into latin america they were trying to you know basically put their money to work in some emerging markets and they would go down to south america or latin america and they would they would meet with the leaders and these people were so charming and intelligent and they would basically just take them to all these wonderful villas and, and demonstrate, you know, how, how well run their countries were, you know, and then they would actually take a taxi cab to the airport and they'd see how poorly things actually looked uh, outside of the, the palace walls. So there is an isolation effect to these elites that I think limits their knowledge, at least about some of the, the issues that are facing the majority of the people in the world, at least in the, in the poorer parts. Uh, but also, you know, in the developing world, we're starting to see this hollowing out where the middle classes are, are going away. And I personally know a lot of people who are in the sort of upper middle classes who have not experienced that because they work at places like Google and, and other very large, uh, profitable companies. They have no idea. They, they, they live in their little urban enclaves, uh, typically on the coastal parts of the United States. They never go to the, the heartland. They never see the, the Midwest and the Rust Belt where they've, all the factories have closed and moved to places like China and Mexico. They, they just have no idea. And they're very intelligent, too. They've gone to really elite universities, but they just do not get outside of their social clique. And they either willfully don't know or they just, by circumstance don't know but regardless it's not an excuse if they want to lead other people and these are unfortunately i do not think are the right people to be leading the majority of the population because they just don't understand the issues facing them there is uh, so, indeed, indeed if i may add there is one element one psychological element that is important within the the elites i, I don't know many but I, i've known a few like larry ellison or uh, <laughs> um a few in silicon valley like that did you go on um, his yacht <laughs> <laughs> no, but I have, you, yeah, I've, I've met him several times. We had dinner a few wow. times. And um, anyway, or like uh, Mark Benioff at Salesforce, sure. I used to work at Salesforce.com. Yeah, he used to be at Oracle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, and and very interesting, interesting people, uh, bright, great ideas. Uh, not always successful, but mostly successful. In, in and and when they are, it's uh, you know winner takes all. So it's uh, that's the way it works. But often they also have in the back of their mind the because they they are very as you said they're very smart people. They think, well, if things go bad, I am so rich and I have so much money that I, that I can turn around and um, and find a solution. For example, um, Larry Ellison bought an island in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And uh, he owns a big island, a very large island with a lot of people. I, I don't know if they really thought thoroughly the the consequences of, of what they're preparing for. 
because that's what I'm trying to do for myself or my family. And and I, the problem of the very rich person is that he doesn't have the um, you know I do I, I used to, I, do, I used to do a bit less now, but I used to do consulting to some of let's say um, high net worth people, but probably not as rich as uh, billionaires, but below that. Uh, to give them some ideas and strategies about how you can prepare for 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 what's coming, yeah. and uh, often they say, well, you know, they they give me their their plan, which is oh, but I have a big house and I have a, a gardener that does the garden, so we can get fresh food and I have solar panels and so on for an, and for electricity and so on and so on. And I say, well, how about security? And I say, well, I have um, I have my head of my chief of security, and and I usually shock them by saying, well how is your wife or daughter getting along with the head of security? And they say, well, why, why this question? And I say, well, because he's going to kill you and, and, and take them. So, and, and the guy is shocked usually because he say, well, why? And because he has the guns. He knows how to use them. But and I have so, the money that will be worthless in a collapse. Exactly. And, yeah. and, 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 and then they say, well, should I, should I store some gold? I say, yeah, so he can now, the guy will also have some gold. So, <laughs> So the, the, the thing is, the, what makes uh, organized crime successful is, of course, the brutality and so on. But at the root of it is that the people who are doing, the people of the gangs, whether it's the Italian mafia or the other more powerful mafias in the history in the world, it's that they know each other. They're from the same village. They're some from the same family. They're brothers and cousins, so they don't betray each other. So yeah, of course. Then they have soldiers. They have they are hiring guns for hire. But they know that they have enough strength within the core of the family or the village that there there is trust that is way above uh, the trust of foreigners or strangers. So we we will have to face such odds in these scenarios. That who's gonna you know we don't even today calling the the police is not. Uh, is not fast enough to solve a lot of the problems. So how are we going to do um, uh, in, 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 a, in a degraded world? Even if it's uh, if you, even if it's temporary, I'm not even talking about uh, um, the, the 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 apocalypse. You know, the end of the the civilization. It can be a disaster that lasts uh, several months, several years, or as you mentioned earlier, we have um, Venezuela right now. You look in in a few years. The world is still running. You still have uh, you still have uh, uh, your um, Walmart being supplied in the U.S., but in Venezuela, they're eating cats. They're eat- they've eaten the animals of the zoo. They have they are prostituting themselves uh, to foreigners. It's a it's a disaster. Well, it's socialism, but in a few years, it just um, it's just made the com- the, co- the country collapse, despite still having resources. Despite still producing oil, uh, they just mismanaged it so much, uh, and there's probably been some meddling, of course, from from some big countries. But uh, still, uh, for the people in in Venezuela right now, it is an economic collapse, and they have to deal with um, having no food in the supermarkets, having no electricity, having having all these problems, and having gangs coming and stealing stuff and 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 killing and and robbing. So. The, the the organization against such things is not necessarily money. It's it's really having a strategy that takes into account. Um, well, I explain this in my books, of course, these seven elements that you need to to secure. But certainly, the the social links and the strength of of the bonds that you have with the people, hopefully your friends and family, but also some of the peoples that you live with and around you, is very important because. You you will have to have trust in difficult times, and and this is where we are really in a bad situation in the West because we can say all we want about this very inefficient tribal functioning of most cultures around the world, but at least within the tribe uh, there is some hierarchy that is recognized and there is some modus operandi, some some ways of working that that are very well oiled and functioning. Uh, it may be, it may sound crazy for for a rational mind, because sometimes it's based on religious beliefs, it's based on customs that are that are ha, ha, have their roots 
back in time for centuries, but at least in difficult times, they stick together. It doesn't mean it's not violent, but they stick together. In our world, not only do we bring these people who are stronger than us in terms of in terms of um, in with in tribal uh, support and 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 and, and um, but also we are becoming totally devoid of that. We are full individuals who don't trust people from our own family, and um, and who because we move so much, we don't even build friendships that are that are meaningful. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be very, 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 very difficult for Western people to to survive, uh, literally survive what is coming. Very difficult. And I think a lot of that is due to the increased, uh, you know, commodification of everyday life. Like it's actually fairly easy, uh, especially um, if you do have a higher income and kind of a higher standard of living you can arrange your life so that you really don't depend on the sort of social uh, graces or like personal reciprocity or kind of a metaphysical favor bank for your day-to-day existence. Mm -hmm. If you need food, you go buy food. If you need housing, like you purchase housing Uh, and you know, you can quite easily go to your, uh, your cube job back to your house and whatever you do for fun on the weekends without actually um, sort of uh, creating any social bonds that are worth anything more than kind of the expectation of basic uh, courtesy. And in a lot of ways, uh, people with sort of a more tenuous personal living situation uh, end up in a much better situation if they are uh, so unfortunate as to actually live through some sort of a resource shock. So yeah. what you saw in um, every case that I can think of from uh, Yugoslavia to Syria to Venezuela is that pretty much everybody with resources um, who didn't have some extremely compelling reason to stay was able to get out on a flight sooner or later and that was their survival strategy and that's an excellent survival strategy is to get the heck out of dodge now if you're somebody who uh, was sort of left behind and all you have is your rapidly uh, inflating away bank account without any sort of uh, meaningful connections or uh, people that you can rely upon but you know you've got a nice house with a lot of nice stuff you're maybe not quite such a uh, attractive target as the uh, the millionaires that you were talking about previously but you are definitely on the list because you're conspicuous you're isolated and you're fundamentally not able um, to protect yourself or reorient yourself towards the new uh, social arrangements that are rapidly uh, coming into your neighborhood so uh, i mean I don't know that like there's we can maybe um, start talking about kind of the uh, the advice um, that you would uh, perhaps give to people in these circumstances. But I mean, I really can't think of a more kind of a priori essential precondition than just having people with reciprocal trust, like to have a gang when you get down to it. Yes. Yeah, uh, D- Dmitry Orloff, one of Bureau's uh, fellow collapsitarians, talks about how, in a crisis, rich people are actually some of the most uh, useless people you can know because, uh, and I, I've experienced this in my own life, they, they don't know how to do anything. They, they can't fix anything. They're used to basically buying everything with their money. And they're typically very standoffish and very classist in terms of only wanting to associate with people of their standing or wealth, at least. Uh, and they have a hard time communicating on a just a normal basis with other people. And so these are not exactly the types of people you want to network with if you're worried about a collapse scenario. You want to network, arguably, with people who know how to do things. And also, uh, I would add that you want to have something that you can offer them because this is the basis for trade relations. Uh, and in a crisis, putting sentiment aside... Uh, having a need to have versus having a friend is probably a little bit more reliable. And so if you want to be able to uh, do something for them, have some skills. I would always argue having skills over having money uh, as being more valuable. It's more portable, can't be stolen. Uh, 
uh, and it's something that is attached to you only, so you stand out. Uh, but Piero, uh, your thoughts on how to build effective networks before things get bad? Yes, I must say that is the most difficult one for most people because we have we have been so much uh, brought to be individuals and uh, and to think um, you know that we have to do everything by ourselves or by whatever whatever service or product is needed. Um, and and in in reality, we have to become image. <laughs> this is the this is the this is what we should um, we should um, we should aim for. But uh, but hey, no one wants to be an image unless you're you're in that religion. And um, it's um, it's also not very let's say sexy and enticing because if I say to people, well, you have to go back to a life that is way way more simple. Uh, and people say, "Wait, you mean I don't I don't go out on Saturday nights? On Saturday nights, I don't I don't date girls on Tinder and things like that." People people will say, "No, no, no, no way! This is too much. I have to lose too much." So, indeed, you have to find a strategy that is um, a bit more mellow and 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 uh, how you say you go by by little steps. And the approach I I figure out works with a lot of people. Uh, and also doesn't scare them into the, you know the the media has portrayed the survivalist movement and even the preppers in the US and elsewhere as a little bit um you know gung ho gung ho they like the guns they live in a bunker uh, all these all these nonsense but still when you when you talk about preparing for disaster a lot of people think that you are a bit um you know deranged uh, I, I know in the US this is not so because it's uh, it's much more older and more common but still um let's say the, the the typical liberal journalist will portray you as a crazy guy they they have a hard time with me because i i i, I i'm well read so so it's uh it's difficult to to that's why they they don't like to interview me anymore <laughs> but um but the, the the reality is that you have to go you have to seek autonomy and autonomy means a lot of things, but if you look at first the the if in, in what you need uh, physiologically, well, you need autonomy for water, you need to uh, autonomy for food, you need autonomy for healthcare and, and hygiene, you need autonomy for energy, and you need autonomy for knowledge and skills. Of course, you need autonomy for defense, and lastly, and which is the most important point, you need this autonomy in terms of social bonds, and. Uh, this autonomy is something that you aim for. It doesn't mean that you are going to ever reach 100% because specialization is very important and you will have people who are specialized into, into one, one element or another within any community. And indeed, it's going to be easier to have it in a rural part of the, land, of the, of the, of the nation or the, or the country than, than in, in the cities. And for that, indeed, my friend... Dimitri Orlov is a friend, of, is, is, and, and so is uh, James Kunstler. They they both have talked about how the city and how the, the 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 way you think in your mind when you are living in a big city where everything is provided to you and everything is 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 very efficient and fairly easy has to be is very different from the mindset that you develop when you live in a small town, which is the best very small town or, or, or a small rural uh, village. So I'm never saying actually to people that you must live alone in your shack in the woods because because people get crazy. And first of all, imagine if you're a married person with children, if you say to your wife, now we, we're going to have to move to some isolated place where there's no, no nowhere around, she's not going to like it. So it's not a realistic approach. And also you need community, you need people, and you need strengths in numbers of def for defense, for, uh, again, specialization, for, for food, for skills. So indeed, we need to reinvent the village, and it can be a part of the town. It can be, a, uh, the, 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 it can be done without leaving the technology that you are used to and, and the the, 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 the you, you know you, you can keep your your toilet you can keep your your running water you can keep your electricity it's just that you're starting to build little by little a fail safe system that you add progressively and maybe maybe you start to grow 
two or three ways to get your water. You start to have um, your, you still buy food in the, in the market, but you also grow a little bit of food and then you expand that. You learn to live in a healthy way. You learn to eat better food. You learn to, to not rely on medicine, on doctors, on antibiotics. It doesn't mean that if you're really sick, you don't go to the doctor. No, you, you do go to the doctor. But you learn to self-medicate a little bit. You learn not to trust the advertising about medications. Otherwise, if you believe advertising, we're all sick. Yes, but no, <laughs> we can, uh, we can, uh, we can de disintoxicate ourselves from the modern way of life and keep only the good, the good things and get rid of the bad ones. So we need to make a mental secession. Uh, that's that's how I call it. You know, you have to secede from the modern world in your in your mind, and then you have to behave. You have to become a barbarian, like um, Jack Donovan in his books would say. You have to think in a way that this is a dying world, and and you're never going to have. You're never going to make America great again. You're never going to make France great again. That's it. These countries have have died already. Now I know it may it, it could be shocking for a lot of people to to hear this. But I think we we have to we have to admit that it's over. We have to recreate something new. But we have it. We can do it progressively, and we can do it while feeding out of the the, the, the Leviathan, out of the beast that is that is still alive but dying. And um, and and maybe some people think, well, 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 this is a bit selfish because uh, we want to save our great nations. But but I usually tell them, look around you. What great nations? And what people make that nation today? Is it still people who are like you, thinking like you, looking like you? And if the answer is yes, I like everyone, well, then, okay, do it. Do as you want. I mean, by all means, you know, I'm not stopping you and, 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 and you can try. And, you know, you may be right, I may be wrong. But when I look around in, in most cities in Europe, Paris, London, I don't recognize France or, or, or England. I see something else. I see something that is not France or England. So why should I work hard to save that? Why should I? Yeah, I may vote politically for the people who are doing the best in my interest or interests of my people. But I don't see these nations representing me anymore. So, and I'm just summarizing because, of course, I'm in Switzerland. But I'm a say in Switzerland as well. I start to see the same Maybe we're 10 years or 15 years behind, but it's the same process that has completely changed the landscape of uh, Los Angeles, uh, uh, London, Paris. And, and yeah, if I go to Russia, no, I, if I go to Moscow, I see Russia. I see Russian people in the Russian city. If I go to Beijing, I see uh, Chinese people in the Chinese uh, city. Uh, uh, but in most other countries in the West, and I'm including Australia and into into that, I don't see I don't see a Western country. I see something different. I see a I see Babel. I see um, we call it something. global homo. Yeah, exactly. I, and and you know, there's a there's a lot of nice things about it. I, let, don't get me wrong. It's if you are hedonist and if you just want to enjoy, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, have fun. But but if things go bad, this is a killing zone, and 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 for anyone who has been in the army, you don't want to be in that place. You don't want you you don't want to be in a place that has no food, no. Because once again, I forgot to say that the problem is we are this globalized world is all great and fine, but <laughs> on on a, on a on a materialistic point of view, by the way, not mm -hmm. not on a spiritual point of view, of course. This goes without saying, but it's all well and fine as long as the supply chains function. And if the supply chain function, or the, if they start to break down progressively, and some people have the theory that it goes down slowly, and and I tend to believe that there are major steps. You know, uh, you know, a, a woman doesn't get pregnant progressively. It's one moment she's not pregnant, one moment she is pregnant. A lot of things in life work in 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 major in major leaps, immediate leaps. And um, when electricity f breaks down, there's no there's no progressive. It's it, for you as an individual. There's one moment before and one moment after, and it's the same for water supply and the supermarkets being empty and so on. And remember that one percent of the people in the U.S. produce the food for the ninety nine percent of the others, and it's the same in Europe roughly. Right. So when the supply chains who are managed just in time stop working. You have movements of panic, 
and you have movements of where suddenly the truck drivers they say, well, the hell I'm going to this city with all this social unrest. I'm not even traveling. I'm not delivering the food. It's too dangerous for me. So then you will have to have these these kind of elements and and the army being able to pro- to supply. Uh, countries of 350 million people like the U.S. is just a joke. They they have no plans to do that. They, they couldn't they have, even do it in New Orleans uh, when the hurricane exactly. hit. And that's so they hope city. for the best. And this is and this is not even talking about uh, what happens very quickly after you have cities that goes bad. And indeed, New Orleans is a very interesting local example. But then you have epidemics. And then you have old people dying, and then you have corpses not being taken care of, and then you, of course, you have crime, and then you have pillage, and then you have f- food being stored, and then you have people going crazy because they don't have, uh, well, let alone food, but they also don't have antidepressants, they don't have the drugs anymore. So you start to have a lot of the things that I, I didn't describe because they are they are too detailed, but they're nonetheless very important, that create this incredible pile of of problems that we are living in. And which are not seen because every problem has a has a, has a way to alleviate it, whether it's medicine, antidepressants, uh, drugs, alcohol. Once you talk, take this away, uh, if I want to take someone's uh, famous quote, the whole rotten um, structure collapses. Well, I have, I have a, a few things uh, to talk about. Kind of the the centralization of our our system today uh, the just in time process is part of that in that we have such a large network of supply chains to rely upon that we can arguably keep low inventories uh and so there's you can interpret this a couple ways um one if you only have three days of food on the shelf obviously if you're cut off you're going to have a big problem pretty quickly uh, on the other hand, if you do have a large network of supply, if one portion of the network goes down, you can divert over to a different supplier. In practice, I don't know if this happens, um, at least quickly. Uh, when we saw the uh, there was flooding in, I think it was Thailand, and there was like the half the world's hard drive uh, manufacturers happened there. Uh, the computer industry had a lot of problems. Uh, in the tsunami uh, in Japan, there were similar supply chain issues where you know airplanes couldn't be made because of some of the components that were being manufactured by Japanese companies, uh, things like that. So it's a global system, and so if, if one part of it catches a cold, uh, arguably a lot of the other system catches a cold. But on the other hand, it's it's also having a large system to have backups to go over to when there's a failure seems to also be an advantage. So I'm not quite sure how to balance those two things out. Um, I don't know if you can, if you can sort of forecast like why all of it would go down if, if maybe one of them goes down, I can see how the the infection can happen, but why would you be stronger? And and indeed it's important to tell our readers that what I'm not trying to, to, because often, Okay, let me let me tell you a true story. When 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 I go out in the city, and because uh, I live myself in a farm with my family, but we also have a little a little um, flat in the city where where we we are quite often as well. And sometimes you know we, you're invited to some of these boring social events, and you go there, and I'm there with my wife, and then people and then people who don't know me yet or don't that didn't recognize me from the media, they um, sometimes say, "Oh, what are you doing?" And they say, "Well, I'm a writer," and they all say, "Oh, really, a writer?" You know, they think it's such a such a, a prestigious uh, job. Well, they don't know you don't make any money, but that's okay. And uh, and so and my wife and my wife says, it's "Oh no, job. this is again, yeah." So they they. Um, so they say, and what are you writing about? And usually my wife usually say, no, but, you know, it's okay. <laughs> and I say, well, it's not. And I usually know that this is going to lead to some, some nowhere. And I tell them, well, you know, I don't know if you really want to know what I write about. And usually they say, well, okay, can you summarize it? Well, okay, in summary, you're all going to die very soon. <laughs> I write about why you're going to die. And, and, and then they explain, I explain the details. And they usually are all very um, uh, depressed. And uh, while I'm not a depressed guy, I'm actually quite lively and I like to enjoy lots of things in life and I have fun with my kids and the forest and walking. And, and But 
that's that's what I try to avoid, and that's why one of my next books is going to be on how you manage your fears. Is that I, I'm not telling all this to scare people, <laughs> to 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 make to be doomy and gloomy. I think there is a lot of hope, not for everyone, by far not not the majority, but for for the people who do the work and they they move and they change a bit their life. There's a lot of hopes for a lot of great things. I think. However, uh, it is true that. I, I look for people who, who, who confront my, my thoughts and say, well, as you just said, very interestingly, okay, uh, but this globalized economy is actually stronger in many ways. And I agree. When there is a local emergency, a local problem, suddenly you don't have an isolated country that has to, to, to sort it out on their own. You have people and companies and governments and, and, and help from all over the world that comes and help you. Look, you know, when there is an earthquake, when there is a, you know, the world is there. So, in fact, you have a much, much more powerful and, and strong infrastructure net that is available globally to, to help anyone who has problems. So, in fact, what you could argue is that if you, if you are going to, to experience collapse, it's actually better if you collapse it, if you, if you experience sooner such as, in fact, it's going to be better that you're in Yugoslavia, in, uh, sorry, in, in Venezuela, that you have to eat your cat and, and, and the lion from the, from the zoo, because at least you will have food coming in from, from abroad to help you. They have Chinese bringing in food. Um, but if you're the last country to collapse, <laughs> no one helps you. So, so the, there is a mix of, of and, and a truth of, on, on very much on what you said is that if, if, the, if the collapse is partial or if you're the first country, let's say France or England goes into civil war tomorrow. Well, you would have NATO and you would have United States probably intervening to separate um, the people that are fighting each other in France. Let's, let's not even go into the details of who. But... Um, or you would have maybe troops from Algeria coming in to, to separate the people. But, but once, once you have two, three, four, like in, a financial, like in a financial system, once you have too much stuff falling down... Yeah. Uh, I, I was just going to say, because in the United States, when the financial crisis happened, it was uh, Lehman Brothers being allowed, quote-unquote, to fail, which triggered the real collapse. And they were one of the, the later banks to you know, yeah. succumb to these problems. And it was decided that they should not be helped because we've already helped too many other banks. Uh, and so that's maybe uh, an example of where what you're saying uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, speaking of you know, last country standing, I've always been fascinated by Switzerland. I've never been there, but I've uh, always admired its, um, its strength, its, its, ability to kind of maintain itself uh, in a sea of, of chaos oftentimes uh, throughout, frankly, you know, hundreds of years of history. But um, as you mentioned, and I've heard from other Swiss like uh, Mark Faber, I'm sure you've heard of him. Um, he's talked about gradually, slowly, there's been uh, an influx of kind of this uh, more globalism, you know, more problems happening in, in Switzerland as, as well. Uh, there was a recent law that was, um, I think, voted on regarding guns last month. The New York Times talked about this in Switzerland. And, and you can see kind of the agenda, if you believe in this stuff. I mean, New Zealand is also viewed as kind of a, a retreat for a lot of the wealthy to go to. And they've had just had this big shooting, and now they're talking about getting rid of the guns. So I don't know if there if there's anywhere you can go anymore. I mean... I've always thought of Switzerland as being the perfect place, but given you live there, what, what do you think is happening to Switzerland? Well, Switzerland is, um, has been preserved uh, through the years because of its history, of its legacy of uh, neutrality and uh, geography, I would add. Of course. Um, however, um, also because, you know, Switzerland has had a proportion of foreigners that has been probably the highest in any country in Europe. Uh, however, because of the, of the strict law that we have, the the level, let's say, let's say the quality of foreigners that came into Switzerland, of which I'm, I'm in, I have to include myself into that, was not was not anyone. I mean, Switzerland in, imported foreign workers that were highly skilled or extremely well educated, high IQ, let's say. 
people from any country. So even, for example, they did some studies in the 70s that, uh, for example, a lot of the Greek, um, uh, let's say, immigrants in Switzerland had an IQ of 105, 100 and something quite high compared to the, the average IQ of Greece, for example. That was a, there was a famous study on that. And that's because we got engineers, doctors, intellectuals, and not, and not the farmers, let's say. And so, so that has been going on for, for a century. So, of course, the, the level of, of skills here is very high. So you, you have, in, in, and let's say in, in a city like Geneva or Zurich, you have people from all over the world who are all well-educated, or at least until the last, last decade or so, who don't have a problem of integration because you don't have a problem to integrate, uh, you know, a 120 IQ um, physician, uh, professor of physics from Nigeria. It's not a problem. <laughs> you never have a problem with the guy because he knows that he needs to have a stable family. He knows that he wants to only have two kids. You know, it's not a, it's not the guy from the slums of Lagos who, who, who comes in and, and, and lives off, um, Bulgaries and has and ha- and brings eight children plus makes five locally, so so it's a completely different immigration than the one you've had uh, in the UK and or even worse in France. So so we've been lucky so far, but it, this has changed and this has changed very much. And of course, we start to have uh, the, let's say the the left point of view on politics that is that is very influential. And what has really changed a lot is the media. The way the media, the media used to be, uh, there used to be left media and right media. Today, all of the media have the same voice like everywhere else in the world. So we are fully integrated in the global, as you said, global homo perspective and um, communication uh, that is, br- brings the same message, at least in the Western world. So we are starting to have the same policies as there is there was in the UK. So opening the borders, um, getting in more and more refugees, not asking questions whether that is useful or not to the country. And now I, I know I know some Swiss people who are originally from Algeria or from African countries or from Turkey who are voting super uh, uh, right. You know they're voting for the the people the parties that want to shut down the borders, and they 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 say. I, I I come from these countries. I know these people. I don't want them to come here because I've I worked hard. I've been successful here. I'm an engineer at the at the nuclear research center here in Geneva, or or, or I'm a I'm a dentist. I'm um, also dentist or 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 a physician. I, I don't I don't want these people to come in because I know them. They are selling drugs. They are going to burger people. They're going to bring extremist religious thoughts. I left. I know there's a lot of Iranian people in Geneva. They left Iran because they didn't want religion to rule their lives. And now they start to see people who pray in the streets, who want to have mosques, who, who, who they start to they start to look you look bad at women who don't who, who don't dress uh, the way they expect. Uh, so the 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 Swiss Switzerland is changing. Now, will there be a backlash? Will it change again? Maybe, maybe. And, 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 and you know, you ask the question is where to go. And a lot of people say, ask me, what do you think about New Zealand? What do you think about moving? And I say, well, you can move, but then, then they will catch you eventually. <laughs> like, indeed, you mentioned New Zealand where they start to, to pass gun laws, which, 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 which is very bad news for New Zealanders. And, or you can go to a lot of people say, what do you go? What do you think about going into a, a country like Thailand or Russia? Or, and I say, yeah, sure. It's they're all nice with you now because you're a rich foreigner compared to them. But what what if you're what if you don't have skills? What that, if that's you where don't Mark have... Faber moved to. I don't know if you know yeah. his story, but he's, I mean, he's, he's a super successful yeah. investment banker and he's got money. So he lives in Chiang Mai. Well, I don't really see, you know, when they had those big riots, you know, when the, uh, I forget the, the party names, but I, I don't see how his money is going to protect him in a situation like that. Yeah. So we come back to having the, the team, the group, the people, and um, and uh, the, 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 the network of people. And so where to have this network of people, if not in the place you've been born, in the place you've been raised, in the place where you have most of your friends and family. So 
um, maybe the, the best way is to get to where you know the people and this is probably your, your hometown. And, um, and then apply the strategy, including that parameter as a very important one. So um, now, in, in, of course, in a world where you don't have a family and, and network of friends, then, yeah, the, the question is open of where to go. But if you do have good friends and family, which I think is the, is the case in, as you said, the, the flyover country in the U.S. is still a, a, still a land of people who have strong bonds and connections. Uh, and so is the case for most of Europe and, 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 and certainly most of Switzerland. But every year it's getting harder. Every year the, um, be, there's, there's one other element that, that is important to mention now compared to 10 years ago when I first wrote my first book is that today you have a much bigger percentage of the population who starts to feel very strongly um, what is already a collapse of the economy for at their scale, for them. Look in France, this movement of the yellow vest. This is not people who have political, uh, political ideas or political requests. They just can't finish the month. They just can't pay the bills at the end of the month. So they have no other way that to go to the street and say, we're not happy. But that's, only, that's the only thing they're saying. And there's been millions of them out, and they're still going, going out. And, and, and the repression has been more brutal than ever in France. I mean, you have to go to 1947 to have such brutal repression from the police. So this is already a, a, a sign that in, in many ways the collapse is starting. In some other places, it's less, uh, you don't see it in terms of protest. But when, when the last time I went to San Francisco, I saw thousands of people living in camping tents in the streets. Oh yeah, and I saw, all and of I the saw, West Coast of the United States is like that. Yeah. Yep. It's like a huge slum. And I've seen, and literally I've seen people using the pavement of the streets as toilets. Mm -hmm. And and this this was not the United States my father worked in. This is not the United States I knew when I was a kid traveling there when I was a, when, when, when I was a young young kid or, or young. We all do this it. because it's not the United States we grew up in. I mean, it's changed so much. And I don't even know, you mentioned France. I don't know how Macron is still in power. I mean, I just learned uh, yesterday that he was the mayor of Calais. And when he was doing that, he was threatening the UK with more migrants if they did not uh, allow some of them to come. He was going to send all of them. And, and he's a Rothschild banker. Uh, and he gets written up in you know the elite financial press as being this you know great innovator for the French economy. You know, meanwhile, you know these problems are happening on you know the the lower levels of the country, which affect most people. And he's still in power. I I, I, I just mm -hmm. don't get it. It's amazing to me. Yeah, and uh, but you know they 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 don't you know the elites that rule most of the countries. And, and there's a lot to say about, and, and you know, I'm not as familiar as you are, of course, with American politics. Um, maybe the U.S. right now you have an, an anomaly. It's a Trump is a. It's a. It it's was a not on the huge plans. anomaly. That's why the media hates him. I mean, they're they're Besides, part of the establishment, and he's just disrupted so much of their their plan. But yeah. but elsewhere, plans advance uh, according to schedule. And uh, in the Western world, the weakening uh, and, and the censorship increases. You cannot even criticize the. You cannot. So, so Western Europe starts to look like the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and this is why this is why Eastern Europe, who knows better, starts to starts to wake up and say, "Well, yeah. no, 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 no. We we are not going to accept such and such law because we know where this is leading, <laughs> and this right. is leading to, to to decay and slavery, if not collapse." And 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 Western countries, especially Britain, is kind of waking up, but Belgium, Germany, France are are completely uh, overwhelmed. <laughs> so we, can, we can use those words, fine. And 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 it's so obvious. And now Italy and and, and Spain, because of maybe the the Mediterranean temperament, are 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 less right. prone be submerged and there is a reaction but then you also have demographics because in Italy people are really are really upset and they are in a, in a fighting spirit but um, people under 30 are probably only 10% of the population so you know the, it's hard to fight when you have a, a small population now granted 
we have the technology today to change things very fast. And if, if a country has the political will and enough people to deliver, uh, let's say, a purge, a purge of the media, of the political class, of the elite, and, you know, the problems can be reverted pretty fast, pretty, pretty fast, at least uh, the short-term problems. The long-term problems, which I described at the mm -hmm. beginning of, of our talk, these are will still remain, but at least... As, as, as is the case of Japan, which has all the problems of demography, of, of, but at least they don't have a multicultural world to manage. They, mm -hmm. they are mostly Japanese, and then they think alike. And, and in fact, uniformity is a strength when, when you have collapse. So you could have a change in Europe, countries like Spain or Italy, certainly Portugal for sure, maybe Greece, uh, and all of Eastern Europe. Could, could become maybe not great again, but we could avoid a massive collapse and could have a sort of soft landing, but they will have to go through a, a purge. Yeah. Whereas countries who are way already way too much in the process of, of multiculturalism, such as France, UK, Germany, Netherlands, probably uh, Belgium, um, maybe not Ireland, but, but Sweden for sure today, well, they will have to go to civil war. And they will have to go to civil war. It's not a, actually, have is not the word, the, 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 the word is, they will go to civil war. It's, a, it's an inevitable process. And, and they may, you know, Europeans may win in some cases and may lose in some others. And the, the, the scary element now in Europe is that this civil war is actually encouraged by some of the elites who actually believe that um, having poor people fighting between themselves is actually better than have everyone going after them. I think this is an extremely short-sighted uh, view because with internet, people know, everyone knows who are the elites who created the problem, at least in the term of, if you only take the, the multiculturalism problem on its own, uh, everyone knows who, who, the, who, who enabled and engineered this. This is obvious to everyone, to taxi drivers, to cleaners in the street. When I talk to people, they give me the same names. Everyone knows George Soros, mm -hmm. from from the taxi driver to the cleaner. This is not this is not a secret of of happy few. Everyone knows who who they are. So so it's going to be tough time for for the elites as well, unless they take the jets and fly to some other country. But then we go back to the same problem: is eventually there's no hiding. You have to you will have to to stand the ground, and and this is why. My, my concept of sustainable autonomous base has the idea of a base. And eventually you need, to, you need to root yourself into a land that you consider your own, just as the, the, the barons of the, the early Middle Ages rooted themselves into a place saying, okay, this is my land, this is my castle, this is my people. And we're strong enough to, to make it or not. But if we make it, we are forging a new nation, a yeah. new country. Well, that's what happened after Rome collapsed. It, it broke up into the the feudal fiefdoms of all the different duchies of Europe, and then slowly they reorganized into larger nation states. But it will happen again, uh, I would predict. Uh, in your books, you mentioned two of these uh, communities that kind of resemble kind of modern day medieval uh, communities or castles amongst uh, the forest of of darkness. Uh, you mentioned Casa Pound and uh, the Christiania um, <laughs> civilization. It's a former army base, but it's in, uh, I think, uh, Denmark. Uh, can you talk about those two uh, examples well, real quick? Interestingly, so, you, so you, you must have read this in my book in French, because this, that is in my second book, yeah, which is... It's about the city, yeah. It's going to be out soon. Uh, it's in, we're correcting the final translation right now. But yes, I mentioned these two examples because one is a very leftist uh, example that was always shown by the media as a success. And right. it, it is clearly a success. That's Christiania in Copenhagen in Denmark. And basically what they did is some in the, in the 70s, some, some hippies, let's put it this way, had this idea to say, well, we need to live in an autonomous way. So they, they, they bought this land, they built some houses progressively in the city, it, which is a nice neighborhood. Um, they had these houses, they, they developed 
you know, uh, local currency. They developed uh, ways to to share some of the produce they would grow and uh, they would do some, um, you know, they would do some um, small manufacturing of some uh, curiosities and local uh, produce that they would sell to tourists and things like that. And it's an interesting initiative. Over time, part of it became uh, very, uh, very bourgeois. So it's, uh, so they stop actually doing any, any work, but it's, uh, it's just a fancy place to live. And on the other hand, there was so much drugs going around that, they were starting to have criminal activities uh, with some with some violence, and therefore the police had to come in, and it shattered a bit the dream, this idealistic utopic dream that they had. On the other hand, in 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 Rome, and actually throughout Italy, you have this um, organization called Casa Pound, which um, was a movement of young people reclaiming uh, unoccupied buildings and um, setting up their living space in, in them. So they took buildings that were owned by the state but not used, they moved into them, they made housing out of them, and they brought in young people that were thinking together uh, the same. And, uh, and, uh, and they, are, they have an approach that is, um, they consider themselves fascists. Uh, so in Italy, it's not, it doesn't sound as bad as it would sound elsewhere, but in Italy, it's um, you know, fascism in Italy was uh, had some dire consequences for the country because of the war. But before the war, actually, most Italians were actually pleased with the with the um, with the um, the outcome of twenty years of, of fascism, which a lot of people don't know. But if you're in Italy, this is quite common knowledge. I mean, even the left they they don't they don't dispute that because actually fascism. I mean, the the same same was true in Germany. They won't admit it, but I mean, the people before the war were quite happy, from what I can tell. And it was only the war that really made them reject that ideology, partly for political reasons, not for sort of economic reasons. But economically, you know, a lot of the middle class is doing quite well, from what I can tell. So Casa Pound has this idea, which which was quite remarkable when I interviewed them and I and when I visited them, is that they don't see just the economy, um, they, 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 they try to get as much local and autonomous economy as they can, but they see it also culturally. So they, they have a lot of cultural activities for, of course, for fun, but also for um, expanding their, point, their ideological point of view, uh, which, which is based on, on law and order in a way. So it's a, it's a quite, um, it's a very, it's not a hedonistic uh, view of the world. It's a very hierarchical view of the world. There is no, there is no democracy in their in their approach. It's really they have a leadership, and when the leadership says, "Okay, now we're going to to turn this unoccupied building into housing for for poor Italians or f- for poor Italian families," they they have a big uh, incentive for uh, families who have children. Um, they they go and do it. They don't they don't have a meeting and discuss so they are very dynamic they are they have um, they sponsor they have a um, music uh, festival they have uh, uh, a lot of activities which are regardless of the ideology whether you agree or not with what what the political goals that they have ir- is irrelevant to the fact that it's a very dynamic and very successful movement and they have something like 20,000 uh, young Italians across the country that are affiliated to them officially and who knows who are not officially affiliated who support it in a, in a, in a discreet way in fact they even went to the point where they had people to be uh, um, candidates for election at local local elections in 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 rome for the mayor of rome and for local local um, um, ma- management so and actually some were elected not to not for the mayor of Rome, but for local for local uh, local functions. So so they actually have this multi approach of uh, cultural, economical autonomy, uh, but also political presence, and um, they're starting to be a force to be reckoned. Still small in numbers, but it's an example of an autonomous movement. And I have been with them, and at the beginning of the movement, they were attacked. I mean, when I visited, they were telling me that they had been attacked by leftist movement. And they were not scared to, you know, with with a few text messages across the phone, they they grouped enough people to fight back and to 
to, to rule the streets, at least not all the streets, but the street they're living, they rule them in the sense that they don't allow drugs, they don't allow uh, leftists to come in and protest, and, and, and that means violence. And that was quite interesting because they were in, in a world that we are, we are, we are in a world which is so uh, politically correct to have people who say, yes, we are not scared to use violence because we will, that's how you clean the streets. And the police and army are very supportive of these people, at least, uh, at least uh, when I talk privately to some of them. So there is something happening across the world, slowly, slowly. Uh, you know, civilization not, may, may die, but the people might choose not, not to die and actually survive. And this is, could be one of the ways that people self-organize into something else. And um, I, I see a lot of hope because let's face it, uh, we, as, as I said, we were not going back to America or France or, or Switzerland of 1950. However, it's up to us to make what America in 2050 or, or, maybe, or maybe not even America, but at least some areas of America in 2050 should look the way we want. And it doesn't even mean that America or the United States of America still exists in 2050. I certainly, I seriously doubt it, as Dmitry Orlov also doubted. I think it's way too big a country, uh, and even even France. Uh, I don't, I don't, I would bet uh, a lot of money I don't have <laughs> to to uh, to the fact that France will not exist in 2050. It will be split in many areas. Some of them will be Muslim uh, areas. Some of them will be. Uh, um, autonomous uh, regional like Brittany or or uh, or Savoie or even of course Corsica and and some other places will be uh, no man's lands and 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 that's going to be the way in many many countries because if 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 what I describe in my books is 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 happening and is correct we cannot manage the complexity of such big countries at least not with such heterogeneous populations maybe Russia will still be around. Uh, sure, Japan. Sure, I, I would bet on Japan and Russia to still be around in many ways. But, um, but not United States of America, not Canada, not, uh, not France, not, not UK. This, there's no way this lasts until there's major changes, and I don't think the, the, uh, there is energy of such major changes. Maybe Italy, maybe Spain. Germany, I'm not even sure. It's, uh, Germany is a big question mark. So we'll see. Mr. San Giorgio, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much.